welcome to the uh, fall meeting. Um, I'm delighted you're all here. I do want to take a moment to particularly recognize um, three groups of folks. One is our international participants. Um, it, uh, if you thought it was a long trip from, um, I don't know, uh, Chicago, um, uh, I suspect it didn't get any easier from, um, I don't know, London. Uh, so um, I'm particularly pleased to uh, welcome our international visitors, um, members, um, and presenters. I'm glad you're here. I also want to take a minute to um, welcome uh, the CLEAR and uh, ARL fellows that are here. Um, as you may or may not know, um, CNI doesn't have an explicit um, leadership development program of its own, but um, we try and support um, both the uh, CLEAR and the ARL leadership development programs, both of which are very important, I think, in um, uh, helping to develop um, uh, new leaders for our community by inviting the uh, fellows from both of those programs to uh, join us at our um, CNI meetings and become familiar with what CNI is doing and what our members are doing. And um, we have an unusually um, good turnout here. Um, uh, the CLEAR fellows have scheduled um, their own meeting um, coterminous with this, so um, uh, we have a particularly good uh, turnout from there, and I just uh, urge you as you um, uh, meet these folks at the reception or at the sessions to um, introduce yourselves and um, welcome them. Um, I am very, very pleased to be able to uh, host those, um, those groups and to, uh, in that way, have uh, CNI play a part in the uh, broader community uh, leadership development programs. I also, finally, um, in welcoming folks, want to welcome a few new members that we have. Um, <clears throat> one is um, a group that goes by the acronym of uh, JULAC, the Joint University Librarians Advisory Committee, and um, they uh, are they have um, uh, joined us this program year. A second is uh, Appalachian State University. A third is the Internet Archive. A fourth is Union College. And fifth and last, um, just joining us uh, very, very recently, is um, Innovative Interfaces. So I'd like to um, uh, ask you to join me in welcoming all um, five of those new members. Uh, we're very glad to have them on board. And that brings me now to my main um, topic, which I've got to get my props in order here, um, which is uh, sort of a year in review and a look at um, what uh, we think is going to occupy our attention and I think also um, some of your attention in the uh, 2014 year. Um, you should have all received in your packet a document that looks like this um, with a shiny cover that's probably completely illegible due to those lights. Um, it is the uh, CNI Introduction and Program Plan 2013-2014. Um, as with past program plans, it contains some background on CNI and a look at our major um, program uh, commitments and focus uh, in the coming year. It um, is also available as of, I believe, yesterday um, on the CNI website, and I'd urge you to share it with colleagues at your institution and beyond. Um, I think it's a helpful document, not just in understanding what we're doing, but in um, more broadly sketching out um, many of the uh, key issues around um, digital content in support of research, teaching, and learning. 
Um, I would note that it includes a um, bibliography of um, recent publications and reports that um, CNI staff have been involved in, and I believe on the um, uh, web version of this, those are um, linked to the source material itself. Um, if not, you should be able to find links um, elsewhere on the uh, CNI webpage. And um, there are a couple of sort of um, survey and synthesis pieces, particularly that um, I've done in the last few months, one around um, research data management and one around personal digital archiving that might be uh, helpful to some of you. Um, so I do want to take us through at least some of the initiatives um, uh, in the program plan um, and also to talk more broadly about some of the, the big trends that I'm seeing. There are some things I'm going to not talk about. Um, one of the things I'm not going to talk about, um, even though it is prominent in the program plan, um, is some of the work that uh, Joan Lippincott has been leading on um, digital scholarship centers. Um, this, I think, is, um, is very important because it gets at vehicles for um, forging and sustaining collaborations um, in digital scholarship among various organizational components within our research institutions. And it also um, uh, speaks to some issues around um, uh, ongoing um, uh, stewardship of materials that uh, come out of that. The reason I'm not going to speak to it beyond that sketch is because she and her colleagues uh, who have been um, uh, helping her to explore this issue have got a session uh, tomorrow, I believe it is, um, that will go into this in depth. And uh, so I would refer you to that um, session, which I believe we will also be videotaping um, uh, for more on that. Another thing I'm not going to talk about very much right now um, is the outcomes of um, two wonderful sessions that we had yesterday afternoon and this morning of our executive roundtable. Um, the topic uh, specifically for that roundtable at this meeting has been the acquisition, selection, and curation of ebooks at scale by um, uh, university libraries, and also the connections and interactions between um, electronic textbook strategies and library uh, collecting of ebooks, um, and uh, some of the complexities that are emerging um, in that nexus. Uh, the reason I'm not going to talk about that very much is um, because uh, we'll be, I'll be uh, doing a summary session on that tomorrow, and we will also um, be putting out a short uh, report, as we have done um, for other recent executive roundtables of some of the key issues that, um, uh, that were um, part of that focus. I will toss out a sort of a general um, challenge question um, in this area, though, that did come up at our sessions and has come up elsewhere, and where I'd um, love to hear from people offline, and that's this. How can, get, are there examples that you can provide out of um, the recent landscape of books that are being published in electronic format only, or um, elec perhaps electronic format with a awkward optional print on demand, but things where you fundamentally need to be looking at the ebook marketplace um, that contain high impact content. In other words, are we starting yet to see the market emerge where you've got to deal with electronically published material um, because it's not coming out in print uh, in order to get 
coverage of key recent events um, or key recent thinking. And here I'm, I'm thinking specifically about books and the book marketplace and would give a certain amount of bias to things that are occurring um, outside of extremely narrow scholarly domains. I would love to hear um, offline about examples of that that you might come across because I think that is a bellwether for a lot of um, a, a lot of very significant developments and will ultimately trigger some um, important uh, public policy um, issues as well. Uh, so I will toss that out as a general uh, challenge. I will mention, by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Executive Roundtable, um, it is described in general in the program plan. It's something where we put out a call for participation, typically a month or two before our meetings. And um, if you've not, uh, if your organization hasn't participated in it, um, uh, I would um, keep a lookout for topics of interest. Um, our preliminary uh, thinking at this point is that for the spring meeting in St. Louis, our topic is going to look at some very specific um, aspects of software as a um, network-based service. Um, including um, uh, issues related to um, continuity of service and um, uh, the ability to preserve materials um, that are being developed in these environments. So um, just something you might want to have an eye out for. Another thing I'm not going to talk about while I'm on this subject, at least very much, um, is MOOCs. Uh, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, if you go back a year ago, um, you could not convene a group of more than five academics for any purpose and get them to stay on topic on anything except for the subject of MOOCs, it seemed like. And, um, you know, while discussion continues um, about them, um, it certainly continues at a um, uh, much, um, much uh, lower temperature, shall we say. Um, I would just make a couple of comments here. Um, one is that there is some interesting um, preliminary kind of research um, that's surfacing that is starting to look at um, the characteristics of folks who seem to um, be most successful at MOOCs um, and um, at learning from them, and uh, I think that work is worth having a look at. Um, I would hardly say that it has um, matured to a definitive level at this point, but I think it takes, it invites us to go back to some much more fundamental questions about, uh, you know, that, that go back to the old characterization of the library is the heart of the university and the notion that, um, you know, really if you just connect a uh, learner with a good library, um, uh, they will be able to learn a great deal and go forward from there. And um, there's no question that that is uh, absolutely true of um, some sector of the population, but it invites us to remember the nuanced distinctions between um, uh, co collections of knowledge collections of open educational resources, um, which is, you know, to my mind, knowledge kind of structured for learning, and then um, uh, actual open education, the delivery of teaching and learning experiences themselves. Um, and uh, perhaps it's helpful to uh, um, think about MOOCs as a reason to um, you know, once again revisit and reflect on some of those distinctions. Um, the other thing that um, I would just say going forward as, as a something to look out for is that um, in the early enthusiasm about MOOCs, there was a great tendency to see them as courses by other means. So um, there was a notion of, you know, the substitutability of a course 
and a course conducted by a MOOC. And I actually suspect that we will see MOOCs or MOOC-like things deployed for purposes that are not delivering traditional courses, but rather certain other kinds of training, methods, um, uh, things that don't fit well, well in the sort of traditional academic, um, uh, you know, everything is a course framework. And um, I, would, uh, I would be thinking about opportunities in that area. Um, uh, for um, using these to enhance and complement traditional kind of course-based educational experiences. Um, I can't quite um, get out of my head the uh, fact that Google decided to um, get into the MOOC business at least uh, briefly, and what they were teaching was really um, what I'd characterize more than anything else as um, you know, information literacy with Google. Um, just worth reflecting on, I think. Okay, so we've talked a lot about things we're not gonna talk about. Let's talk about things we are going to talk about and, that are changing the landscape and um, shaping our program plan. And at least from a U.S. basis, I think it would be hard to um, not give very prominent place to the Office of Science and Technology directive that basically said that um, federal funding agencies were directed to develop plans to ensure public access to both the um, published reports um, arising from research that they fund and also the underlying data that is produced by those research projects. Um, most of you probably know that um, there was an August deadline uh, for submission of draft plans from agencies to back to the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Most of you probably know that those draft plans are not public and that in fact, there's not a tremendous amount known about them, although there is a certain amount of mix of, um, you know, rumor and well-confirmed rumor floating around. Um, OSTP has certainly, I think, been forthright that um, some of these plans are a bit more mature than others, um, uh, depending on the agency. Um, we don't, at least unless somebody's heard something that I haven't heard yet, uh, have a firm schedule for when they will become public. But nonetheless, I think there's a good deal of momentum um, underway here, uh, despite um, a um, government shutdown just to, um, uh, you know, reduce progress a bit for a while. Um, and that um, these... Um, these developments in the agencies are going to um, uh, reshape uh, the landscape for the um, institutions that host these um, researchers as well as the federally funded researchers themselves. I think you can also see similar developments taking place in other nations, and you can see a number of non-governmental funders um, moving quickly towards very similar kinds of principles. Now, one way to think about these developments is sort of very narrowly within the government sector and that um, this is a bunch of new government requirements that we're going to have to figure out how to support and how to uh, ultimately track conformance to in much the same way that we're dealing today with data management plans and um, deposit uh, requirements for National Institutes of Health funded research and things like this. Very much to its credit, I think we've seen the 
leadership in research in higher education, and here I'm thinking not just of the Association of Research Libraries, but indeed um, uh, AAU and uh, APLU as well, the presidential associations, um, really looking at this as a invitation and a challenge to rationalize a lot of what's going on with the um, production and dissemination of scholarly literature and data. And that that really needs to be done anyway. It's needed to be done for quite a while. Um, and that this should be the opportunity to um, really try and step up and do that. Uh, I think that um, a good response here would clearly be one that incorporates and accommodates the, um, the needs of the federal agencies, um, but it should be one that goes beyond it. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes in um, the, um, the obligations uh, and practices that surround scholarly publishing today. Um, it's not just federal agencies, as I indicated, we're seeing private funders step up here as well. We're seeing state level mandates. We're seeing institutional level um, uh, faculty open access mandates. We're seeing a whole range of behaviors that need to be rationalized in some fashion so that um, researchers are not left scratching their heads about how to um, comply with these or um, expending enormous amounts of um, time seeking to, um, to honor these obligations. Um, this is, a, this is an environment that's really in need of some serious streamlining. And um, I'd note particularly, again, just speaking personally and from my perspective, that um, we've seen this sort of unfortunate um, framing of various competing responses to, um, to uh, the OSTP mandate, um, ranging from the SHARE initiative that I just described to a um, set of responses coming out of some of the STM publishing community under the name of CHORUS to various um, uh, governmentally based archives. Um, uh, sort of using something like PubMed Central as, as a model to scale up from. All of these have a place in this ecology, and um, I'd like to really, you know, make a plea and a pitch for looking for an ecology that makes sense and that uses all of these where they belong. Um, just as an example, um, one of the, the very useful things about Chorus, one of the things that I think is very attractive about it is that it makes articles available in context to readers. Um, with, you know, within the context of the journals in which they appear. And that's something that institutional repositories do not do as a sort of a natural course of event. We need to think about how to strengthen those kinds of connections and collaboration rather than to um, present it as a competition. I'd also just, you know, in thinking about this, um, note that a little bit of redundancy um, in these systems is not a bad thing. Um, we had a very, very interesting um, applied case study happen uh, a couple of months ago. The government decided to shut down except for its essential services. And we suddenly got a real good understanding of how deeply entwined various governmental things are with the overall knowledge environment and scholarly communications environment. Um, to make matters worse, at least in the initial shutdown, as I understand it, um, a number of agencies um, or resources within agencies that were deemed non-essential um, were actually shut down 
or had their home pages redirected to some machine saying, sorry, the government's closed, um, come back later. Um, they, they didn't even go the you know, route of putting it on autopilot, hoping the machine doesn't crash, and maybe we can at least get Eck out a few weeks that way, and they'll get the government reopened. Although my understanding is that somehow later on, some resources were moved from the first approach to shut down to the just leave it turned on and un, um, unstaffed uh, model. So um, it's very interesting to look as a case study at what was unavailable during that period and what resources the government actually did deem essential. Um, I would note that at least at some level they did deem um, PubMed Central essential and that did stay up, although, as I understand it, it was not um, ingesting uh, new contributions. Um, those kinds of sensitivities um, to the continuity uh, and good management of <clears throat> specific players within this ecosystem um, do remind us of the virtue of a certain amount of redundancy. <clears throat> I'd, um, I'd connect that too to some very interesting conversations that took place recently at a meeting with the rather forbidding name of Anadap2 um, that was uh, organized by uh, Catherine Skinner and Martin Halbert and uh, a couple of other folks. Um, this was a follow-on to a meeting that was held in Estonia a couple of years ago. It took place in November, just before Thanksgiving in um, Barcelona. And it assembled mostly national libraries, some research libraries, to look at what it characterized as aligning national digital preservation strategies, and that leads you to that horrible ANADAP um, uh, acronym um, when you pick the right words out of that. But the word alignment there is one that I think bears a lot of thinking about. One can see very clear advantages to aligning strategies at a nation state level. But one also recognizes that there are certain functions that nation states are unwilling to rely on other nation states for. They decide that these are critical enough and core enough to what they do that each nation wants to maintain a certain amount of autonomy and ability to carry out those functions rather than getting into one of these interdependent collaborations where um, you are absolutely reliant on someone else to do things to carry out your own core functions. Um, this is a, this is a um, set of trade-offs where We've, we've talked a lot over the years about interinstitutional collaboration and when that crosses the line um, into interdependence where um, all of a sudden you are critically dependent on another institution rather than just doing things that are collaborate, collaborative and build collective value. Um, and um, I think casting it in the framework of delivery of services and preservation um, is, is a very provocative and constructive discussion that, um, that deserves our attention. I think as we think about how to design ecologies like the one that is shorthanded by um, Cher, um, these are principles that um, we need to consider a bit. So Cher, I also want to re remind you, uh, going back to the OSTP drivers, um, is not just an opportunity and a challenge to straighten out how we're handling scholarly publication. It also deals with data. 
And I want to remind you that there was a second executive order that took place over the summer, which for reasons I don't understand did not get the same kind of airplay that the OSTP memorandum um, got, which basically told federal agencies that as you are designing data systems, the default thinking um, unless it has to be modified by considerations of security, confidentiality, personal privacy, and other things. The default consideration and assumption should be you are to provide public access to data, to your data, to the data that your agency generates and exercises stewardship over. Um, another, another very powerful driver towards opening up um, data resources. Now, um, I'd note, by the way, the word public there, which is a very popular one in governmental circles. Um, they are not using the rhetoric of open, they are using the rhetoric of public. And um, I don't want to read too much into these choices here, um, other than to note that when you talk about public access and a commitment to make the um, public of the United States um, have use of data that the government produces, you can construe that very narrowly as, you know, there's a bunch of bits up here for FTP or other downloading. All the way through, we are going to construct systems that help the public understand what in some cases is rather abstruse data that comes with a um, very complex contextualization. And I can tell you that um, uh, there are people in um, government who share that commitment to making data public um, who are really struggling with where to go um, along that continuum that I've just outlined, particularly in light of the um, helpful additional language in all of these directives, which basically says, oh, and by the way, there's no money for this. Take it out of existing resources and do it in your copious spare time. Um, you know, that, that um, adds an extra element of challenge to uh, trying to take the broad interpretation of that. Um, but I think we need to, you know, be mindful of some of this as we make our own plans for how to handle data. And I want to say just a couple of things about issues emerging in the data area. Um, we spent a lot of time on that at CNI and in other venues, and um, uh, you know, there's a great deal of good work going on in this area now. It's quite striking to me how the research and higher education community is beginning to, you know, seriously mobilize to address at least the front end of these needs through bit preservation services. Um, I would highlight two areas that I think are going to be very, very difficult. One is um, data that is um, that is constrained because it contains personally identifiable information or personally re-identifiable information. Um, one of the things we seem to be learning again and again in different areas is that anonymization, while it's a useful tool, is a tool of very limited power and somewhat limited application, um, that it is um, frighteningly easy to de-anonymize um, data that one might think is anonymous um, and that we're going to need some um, really fresh thinking, I believe, about um, uh, how to handle um, personal privacy and personal data in a world where we want to gain the maximum advantage from the free re re reuse and recombination of research data. The other area that I want to put on the table, and it's one I've been thinking about a lot lately, is the move away from people talking about open-ended commitments to preservation of data and the kind of thinking instead that you frequently are seeing now um, encapsulated in um, data management plans, like I'll keep this data for 10 years. I'll preserve the bits, 
I'll make it available. Probably within a 10-year life cycle, it's manageable to document what's in the data so someone can reuse it. There's a better than even chance I'll be alive if they really get stuck and they need to ask me or one of my graduate students. It's, it's quite a different proposition from, you know, I want to pass this data across a thousand-year chasm um, and, and still have it reusable on the other end. Um, so what they say, as I indicated, is, okay, we'll make arrangements to keep it for 10 years, let's say, as bits. There are a number of commercial services, um, uh, institutionally-based or consortium-based kind of um, bit preservation services that are in place or going into place, where you can prepay 10 years. Ten years is a manageable thing to run a prepay service for. Um, it doesn't suffer from the same kind of fiduciary, um, you know, sensitivities to interest rates and other stuff that 50-year commitments or other really long-term things do. Um, so you're seeing people step up for that. And the general proposition is we'll go ten years and... At the end of 10 years, we'll see what kind of use was made of it and go through some kind of process where we'll either decide to throw it away, fund it again for another stretch of time, or perhaps find it a new home as part of that funding. We have no process for doing this at the moment. Um, this is a process that will need to engage all kinds of scholarly communities and remember that at various points in data life cycles, the s different scholarly communities may be interested in the same data or alter their priorities for keeping it available. Um, this needs to cross institutions. We're going to need registry mechanisms for this. Um, Constructing methods for doing this are going to be absolutely fascinating and incredibly challenging. Um, and uh, I think we're going to see these in other settings, and I'll return to that in just a minute. But I would certainly nominate this as an area that it is not too soon to start really thinking seriously and systematically about. Those 10-year countdowns are going to be upon us um, you know, before we know it, it's going to come really, really fast. So this whole, this, this is an example of a broader issue that um, I've been looking at quite a bit lately and that um, I think we need to understand much better, and this is transitions of stewardship. The notion that somebody's been taking care of something and now their commitment is expiring. Maybe they're going broke, or maybe they just need to reallocate resources, or something else has happened, but we need an orderly way of putting this, putting this information resource before the broader community and having a conversation and perhaps a decision-making process about is it worth continuing to keep it, and if so, who's going to step up to it? Um, huge challenge there. And um, one, one, by the way, that is growing some fascinating new dimensions. Um, I'll, I'll just suggest one. We're getting very, very good at making digital surrogates of things. Um, in two dimensions, we're really great at that now. Um, to the point where, you know, we can um, replicate, uh, essentially, um, a good deal of uh, fine art and other sorts of material. And the big difference between the replication and the original is provenance. Um, it's getting real hard to tell the objects apart. Um, we're making substantial strides with three-dimensional works as well. Um, I don't know how many of you noticed the um, conference that the Smithsonian put on a few weeks ago, highlighting the work that um, is going on in three-dimensional capture and reproduction of various kinds of, um, of objects of interest. Uh, to different communities, but that's a significant development. So now we actually have the opportunity to um, potentially kind of peel off some of the scholarly side of artifacts that are of interest for both, um, you know, sort of collecting and um, uh, exhibition 
reasons and also as objects of study. And that's going to come into play, I believe, in some of these choices about stewardship transitions as well. Um, the last thing I'll say about this area, and we could talk a lot more about it, and I hope we will over time, um, is that there are lots of cultural memory organizations or things that embed cultural memory organizations that are under tremendous stress. Um, I'd simply invite you to watch the discussion about what is or isn't going to happen to the materials that are stored at the um, Detroit Institute of Art. Um, there is a uh, theory, at least, that is um, being um, put forward that um, since these are worth some substantial hundreds of millions of dollars, um, selling them off in order to uh, deal, to help pay off the creditors to the now bankrupt city um, would be a very sensible idea. Um, that, for example, these could be used to help meet pension obligations that the city is unable to honor. Um, without getting into the you know, public policy pros and cons there. Um, uh, I think the important takeaway is just this sort of thing is in play, and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of organizations under severe financial stress. Um, so we need we need, I believe, to be thinking about these kinds of transitions more systematically. This takes me to a final set of things I want to say in the digital preservation area. And these really deal with um, rethinking where we're assigning resources. And here I want to recognize a, a wonderful, um, uh, succinct um, talk that um, David Rosenthal and um, Vicky Reich gave at the Barcelona meeting I alluded to earlier, which um, at least for me, crystallized a lot of thinking I'd been doing around this general topic. Um, there are two things that are troublesome. One is that we don't know how well we're doing with a lot of our digital preservation work. Um, we, we have some sort of individual snapshots. Um, for example, the work that um, um, Bob Walvin and uh, Oya Rieger um, from Columbia and Cornell shared with us a year or so ago, and we'll see an update on that at this meeting, where they tried to look at what part of their journal subscriptions at Columbia and Cornell were actually covered in the various mechanisms like Portico and locks that we've put in place to try and preserve that material and got a disturbingly low number. Um, another area that has seen some um, academic investigation is how much of the web gets covered by various web um, archiving services like the Internet Archive. But in general, we don't really have an inventory of the classes of things that are out there, and we don't have good estimates of um, what's, what part of these is covered. We also don't have good estimates of where um, the areas of highest risk lie. Um, we're very much in danger of, you know, the, uh, of, of recapitulating the old joke about the guy crawling around under the street light looking for his keys. And, um, you know, he's asked why he's looking there when he lost them over there. And he says, oh, the light's better. Um, there, there's a certain tendency to go after the easy stuff here rather than the stuff most at risk. Um, I'm, I'm starting to feel like um, really part of our, our strategy going forward here needs to become much more systematic. And um, that jumps me actually to the last um, uh, couple of things that I want to say. I'm going to um, skip some other speculations in the interest of having at least a few minutes for um, uh, questions at the end. Um, another place where we're seeing a kind of a, an emerging um, uh, set of activities that need to turn into a system very badly 
is in an area that I'm now thinking about as distributed factual biography. This is this whole mess of issues about author identities, citations, aggregation of citations, um, uh, interchange of these and compilation of these in various ways. It's connected to compliance issues for um, uh, some of the federal funder requirements that we talked about earlier. It's connected to academic assessment in various ways, to social networking among scholars, um, to identifying um, uh, important publications in, in, through citation networking and things like that. Um, we've seen an enormous amount of activity in this area that um, uh, CNI has been trying to track and a great deal of siloed work where we've tried to help promote and broker some conversations uh, across silos. Um, but really what this is creeping up towards is a place where we have factual biographies, we can fragment them into small pieces, reassemble them, distribute them, um, update them in little, in little bits. Um, and there are big questions we need to ask about this evolving world, um, including um, what degree of assurance we want in it, how easy is it to, um, to fake things, to what extent do things need to be computationally confirmable. We need to think about um, privacy and what role privacy plays or should play or does play in the notion of factual biography. Um, given that you publish things and that has its roots in making them public, is the fact that you published them a secret or should it be able to be? I don't think so, but um, as with anything in this area, you can find someone who will argue that it should or it at least should be the author's option. Um, there's a final um, issue that comes up in that realm that's really interesting, and that's what I'd call noteworthiness following Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia has this whole um, very complicated set of criteria for deciding whether your biography is worthy of Wikipedia. Um, and um, actually this is subject to great debate apparently as various um, entries are proposed in there. And if you look at it, this actually has a rich, rich, wonderful history. It goes back to, um, you know, the people who were preparing uh, national dictionaries of liter literary biography in the 19th century. And because these were going to be published volumes and cost a lot of money to research, they were quite constrained in the number of people they could represent and then had to figure out who was worthy in there. So you actually can make some you know, notion about when does someone become a public figure and uh, tie that, that noteworthiness into the privacy debate. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of um, work to be done there, but this again is going to be a landscape reconfigurer. So I want to close my comments with um, a sort of a final large trend that um, is showing up. And this is um, a notion that I think was originally framed um, uh, kind of elegantly by um, Chuck Henry at CLEAR. And that is this notion of what he calls coherence at scale. Um, and he's actually set up a, a working committee to explore some of this. But it's the notion that um, we are moving past an era where we build fairly little systems and then federate them, um, that in fact we need to be thinking at, at scale and need to be thinking about how, how um, systems interrelate to each other, how they in some cases depend on each other. You look at developments like Hadi or um, you look at uh, the share um, ideas that I've sketched for you. You look beyond academia as well, but to places that are hospitable for at least some discussions with academia, Wikipedia, um, Google, 
Microsoft with its uh, research, with its Bing system, Internet Archive. Um, uh, there are very fruitful discussions that need to happen across those boundaries as well as just within the pure research community. Um, look at the incredible accomplishments that DPLA the Digital Public Library of America has pulled off in the last few months as um, Dan Cohen has taken the helm there and really led them forward. And I would suggest that one of the most important things he's done to move that effort forward is not just to talk about what they are going to do in the near future, but to be very clear about what they're not going to do in the near future. And by implication saying someone else needs to do that, we need to make some other provision for that that is consistent with DPLA and the broader community that DPLA aggregates. Um, I think we're gonna need a lot more discussion like that going forward. And um, I genuinely hope that these meetings can serve and other activities that CNI will seek to advance can serve to act as a forum for those kinds of conversations. Um, I'm really of the opinion that the sort of scale of engineering that um, we're looking at to manage scholarship, to manage research knowledge, um, is crossing um, some fundamental thresholds um, and that we're going to need to do things very differently in the future than we've done in the recent past. Um, examples of this are all around us. Um, uh, I think you only need to, you know, keep your eyes open. Just, just imagine um, this one as a, as a sort of a simple example. Um, some of you are probably old enough to remember the Pentagon Papers back around the era of the Vietnam War, Daniel Ellsberg collection of government documents that he made off with, which are, you know, very fundamental reference now to people writing accounts of the politics and geopolitical strategy of that time. Um, very, you know, very important documents from a scholarly perspective. Um, uh, you know, that, that go very, very far beyond the immediate incident. Um, that was a book. It was a fairly fat book, if I recall, about a thousand pages. Um, but it was something that the research community knew what to do with as soon as it was published. What do we do with things like WikiLeaks, which may very well take on similar properties going forward? Um, what do we do with these sort of massive, um, uh, you know, data revelations? That, and, you know, I just throw that out as one of many, many examples. It's just an area that's getting a lot of press. And we could have a very interesting um, uh, conversation about what are the right strategies in this particular area. But I think, um, you know, it serves as a very simple example um, along with the records of any recent political um, uh, administration and how those compare to the records of administrations 50 years ago um, about how we need to think differently at scale. So with that, I invite you to um, read more details and more um, thinking in our program plan. I invite you to work with us to continue to shape um, ideas like this, clarify them, and advance them. And I hope that I've at least given you a little bit of um, useful perspective on some of the places where I see the landscape um, uh, changing in some pretty significant ways today and in the pretty near-term future. Thanks for listening. And I think technically we're out of time, but I'm going to take I, I'm going to take one, hopefully two questions anyway, if there are some. There is a microphone here, or if you just want to shout, I'm happy to uh, try and repeat the question.
comments are also welcome, um, as well as questions. Any takers? Go for it, Michael. I'll use the microphone since my voice is failing a bit. I'm Michael Siedl from Humboldt University of Berlin, and I was particularly struck by what you were saying about the uh, archiving and our need really to, to show, to prove that we are succeeding in this. Um, we have a project, a national hosting project in Germany where we are really going to do some serious testing with various systems to have some actual concrete benchmarks to say, what they can do and where they can't do things that are important for us in terms of the archiving. So I, I applaud that um, piece of your speech especially. Um, I, yeah, I, it's hard to, to figure out here. Um, there's, there's a tendency to keep improving stuff you have, so um, to think in terms of how you can make things that are already inside the sort of general grip of our memory organizations and archives more reliably archived. So we actually, you know, are seeing this sort of strange phenomena now where we keep layering on more and more backup redundancy layers of, um, of copies. And this does improve the reliability of it at some level and um, actually you know quantifying that is is very very hard for a lot of reasons we don't have time for um, going into right now but I, I I'm starting to get nervous about how much resource we put into that investment versus how much resource we put in gathering things into some, at least some kind of um, stewardship environment in the first place. I have a feeling that that, um, at least for large classes of material, that first um, gathering in, um, and I don't even want to call it ingest because um, you know that that adds too much of a systematic flavor to it. Um, uh, I suspect maybe uh, the highest sort of cost return um, uh, investment we can make now in in some areas. I think it this really needs to be looked at carefully. We'll take one more in the back. Hi, Cliff. Uh, Jeremy Frumpkin, University of Arizona. Um, I really appreciated your uh, mention of this sort of factual biography, along with uh, issues around uh, researcher identification, uh, social networking, things of that nature. Have you seen any activity, and what are your thoughts around um, the increase in annual faculty annual review systems that are being instituted in a number of uh, research institutions and elsewhere, and libraries' involvement in both those activities and how they might leverage the data coming from those activities? Um, yeah, I mean, these, these sort of faculty, um, you know, what have you published, what grants have you gotten, um, achievement forms, um, they are, a lot of uh, organizations collect them. They are one of the most hideous examples of silos I can imagine, um, uh, you know, that are actually operating in the field today. Um, to, just to be as insulting as possible, they usually collect the material in a really helpful form like PDF um, that makes it hard to repurpose or match against things. You're asked to give very similar data, sometimes the same data, on grant applications. Um, you need to go chasing around, cleaning up your personal um, bibliographic record in yet another set of silos. Um, I really see those as a fundamental um, component of uh, both a source and a um, destination for this data we need to exchange around, along with grant management systems and grant submission systems, um, along with bibliometric systems. Um, uh, we, we've got to bust down those silos. They're all moving the same data around fundamentally. Um, and um, I would say that um, in some other countries where um, the government in particular has gotten much more systematic about 
counting and quantifying faculty achievement as a condition of passing out um, uh, budgetary allocations in higher ed. So think the UK with the research assessment exercises. Um, you, you do see a somewhat more sophisticated generation of those systems deployed than are commonplace in the states yet. Although I am starting to see institutions in the states who often have these things and they're often, you know, very much homegrown, um, uh, you know, duct tape and um, rubber band kind of systems saying it's time to really look at this and either build a good one or, or purchase a good one. Um, uh, so I do see some investment starting to happen there. Um, one of the things we really need to look at hard and quick is interchange standards in this area, which are a, a kind of a mess. The, um, the Europeans have done some useful work in a um, set of standards called CERIF, C-R-I-F. Um, and there's also some very good work coming out of uh, the Vivo community. Um, that's worth checking out, but there's a lot of work to do in that area. And now I've managed to keep us over time, for which I apologize, but um, thank you very much, and I'm just delighted you've all made it here. I wish you a great um, afternoon and a great day tomorrow, and I just remind you we all need to be a little flexible with um, schedules and the weather and do check for schedule changes now and again. Thanks and good meeting.